Hi, I'm Randall Pinkston, and welcome to Eye to Eye. Katie is on assignment. A new study finds a growing number of combat veterans are battling mental illness, but many are finding it difficult to get the help they need. Kimberly Dozier spoke to one vet whose search for help took him all the way to the Pentagon. So you were back here for a bit, mm -hmm. and um, you told me that your buddy, one of the medics, had said, I think you got PTSD. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of things were you going through that made you think that? I was uh, drinking a lot to help me sleep because I I, if I tried being sober, I wouldn't be able to sleep at all. And I was uh, real irritable throughout the day and uh, having, started having flashbacks and anxiety attacks in public places and while driving. Flashbacks while you're driving? What does that do? It's like a panic attack, like it just all of a sudden it feel like I was right back there mm -hmm. and I'd, I'd have to pull over and, you know, relax, take a few deep breaths. But I went in and uh, I talked to our PA and... Uh, What's that mean? A physician assistant, uh, was Captain Holmes, and he, you know, he asked me a few questions and we went over something and he said, yeah, you have PTSD and he put me in contact with a social worker um, I was a therapist, and I started seeing her on a regular basis, and they put me on uh, medication. So they diagnosed you with PTSD? I don't think it was an official diagnosis at that time. It wasn't until uh, later on uh, when I got sent up to the R&R &R Center, the uh, Rest and Resilience Center, uh, and saw the psychologist, Major Yao, that uh, he was, it was officially diagnosed, and the memorandums were set up that I'd be separated. How long did it take your commanders to recognize it? It wasn't, it was recognized right away that I had a problem. Um, I don't believe they really thought it was PTSD at first. And it wasn't in, I don't know if they ever really recognized it. So they kept you on the same duties. They kept you being a regular soldier. Mm -hmm. So. Describe to me what that was like. It was real difficult for a while. I was you know, going back to drinking a lot and um, going out to the field, and I would have, you know, every time I heard something, uh, a fake IED or uh, blanks fired from a weapon, it just uh, really disturbed me. And uh, I had a lot of trouble sleeping out in the field and just a really hard time. You were diagnosed and you were waiting to be medically discharged? You were waiting to be discharged? Mm -hmm. They had it. They had it set up that I was going to get a, a chapter uh, 5-17, which was for uh, medical, and we agreed that it would be the best thing for me because it, it would be a, a quick process and it would get me out, you know, soon. And um, my chain of command, you know, just I, it just didn't happen. And then I started to get in the trouble, more trouble. Because they, they they didn't listen. They didn't let you out. They kept you in. And after I started to get in trouble, you know, that's when they, they, they said they were keeping me longer until my punishment was served after, you know, for whatever I just did. And then, um, then it eventually turned into their changing that medical discharge into a, a general discharge. For misconduct. Mm -hmm. One of the tough things is uh, getting flack from commanders and other soldiers for uh, my condition and, and not being able to function as a soldier anymore uh, out in the field as well as I used to. But when I first came into the Army, it was all I wanted to do was, you know, be a soldier for as long as my grandpa did, do 20 years. And uh, it was, I wanted to make it a career in my life, you know. And after coming back from Iraq, it just everything changed. It's just been, there's no way I can do it anymore. And, then, and that's been obvious for almost a year now. This is a really personal story to put out there. This is this has gotta this is gotta hurt a bit. Hmm. Why are you doing it? My big thing is for all the other soldiers out there like me and I know many personally who aren't seeking help, who are having a lot of problems and who aren't, you know, talking to anybody about it. They're not talking about the things that they saw and did and they just keep it built up inside and just, you know, and they're still going out drinking and, and getting in fights and 
And they're going back to Iraq. And they're going back to Iraq, and then they just come back even worse. And, you know, I'm hoping, you know, they need to know that there's help out there.